Hi, my name is Rich Arf, and we're filming this video here at our family pro shop, Ray Arf's Bowling and Trophy Shop, which has been in the St. Louis area since 1976. Uh, yeah, what we're doing today is uh, over the years, uh, Dad started the business 42 years ago, and we've uh, put together pretty much a nice bowling ball collection over the years. The bowling balls have been popular in our Midwestern area. We've, uh, you know, kind of stockpiled, put a collection together, and we thought it'd be fun to share that with you. So what we've done is kind of laid out three different segments we're going to film. One of them is going to be the rubber and plastic ball era. Uh, the second segment will be the polyurethane ball era. And we're going to finish up with the final segment of showing the reactive resin bowling balls that we've put away over the years. All right, we're going to start uh, session one of the bowling ball collection that we put together here at Ray Orr's Bowling Trophy Shop. Rich, why don't you get it started? Well, we're going to start with the wood balls. Um, we really don't even know how old these things are or where we even got them. But uh, the first bowling balls that they used were made out of wood. So we thought we'd at least start here. Uh, we're still not really old timers, but at least, at least we have a little bit more knowledge here on the rubber balls. So Yeah, you black rubber of... balls pretty much became prevalent and dominated through the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, and back then they were made for durability. Uh, they had, what, a lifetime warranty? Yeah, and they're really... They were, made, yeah, they, they were manufactured for strength. Uh, you bought them because they were going to last a lifetime. They didn't really hook. They didn't really carry all that great. You bought them because it was a bowling ball and it was going to be really durable. Uh, we put together some of the classics from that era. Probably the best selling black rubber ball of all time was the uh, original Black Beauty. The ones with the little man on them are the rarest and the most difficult to find. Those are the ones that have the most value. Uh, AMF had their 3 dot amp flight. Later on, they ended up signing the great Dick Weber put his name on the AMF five star. Manhattan rubber was also a very popular ball from that era. And of course we put this ball aside as well. It's a little bit of a St. Louis nostalgia. It's got the arch on it. So us being St. Yeah. Louis, since it's an old black rubber That was a America. unique ball. Uh, the PBA tour was here in 71, sponsored by American Airlines. And it does have the arch on it. So we thought we'd uh, throw this in. And to my knowledge, uh, Brunswick made that ball for the tournament. So it was basically Probably like a black beauty. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well then in the early 60s, uh, rubber started to lose its popularity and it kind of went to the plastic ball era. What they found with plastic balls is plastic was a little softer material and now you started to get more high performance balls. They would grip the lane, they would hook more, give you better pin carry. Probably the most valuable ball that we have in the collection from a dollar standpoint is this one right here. It's a Brunswick Gold Crown. Very difficult ball to find with no holes in it. It's actually got nine karat gold in the construction of the ball. They claim that roughly an ounce of the weight of that ball is made out of real nine karat gold. So it has real value for the fact that it's got actual gold nuggets in the construction of the bowling ball. Um, if you're looking at old crown jewels, they're very difficult to find. The ones that are very valuable uh, have the white dot on them. Those are the original ones from the early 60s. If you're looking around and buy an old crown jewel, if you're a collector, definitely look for the ones that have the white dot. Those are the very original ones and have a lot of value. This is another old Brunswick ball called the True Track. It too was a very high performance, big hooking plastic ball uh, from the mid, uh, mid 70s is when this ball was popular. Yeah, jumping over now to a new set of plastic balls, uh, Columbia really came in the industry uh, in the early 60s also. We've got a rare white dot, we believe, uh, it was one of the first Columbia balls that were made. It's not in the best condition, but we thought we would use this for the video. Uh, we've got a really rare one here. This is a 73. And we even reached out to Mark Roth. We are guessing it was an early Shore D version, um, but you know it, we don't really know that much about it. it. Uh, I definitely um, was getting into bowling at the time. I've got a little more information on the Shore Ds. Columbia really hit it big with the Shore D. This one in particular is really rare, 74. It says S-H-O-R-E, and they are very rare. They actually were outlawed a couple years after they were released because they were too soft. So a lot of these ended up cracking, so they are very hard to find. And I'm going to pass it over to Steve. Yeah, this particular ball right here is one of our favorites too. It's an AMF Pro Classic. It was actually made for AMF by Columbia, uh, made in 1975. Uh, the most valuable are a C series, C5 series ball that's made in 1975. Randy Lightfoot, one of our local friends here, absolutely loves this ball. It's his favorite ball ever. He's looking for one. So if anybody happens to have one, uh, we'd be interested in you know trying to hook up with you to acquire it for Randy. Uh, very great ball. Uh, this one right here is a Columbia ball as well. Uh, when the shorties were outlawed, they were too soft. Uh, Don Johnson 
really had a couple of great years with this ball. It was basically a sure D, but they put a white dot on it. So it was supposed to be a caramel white dot, but it was a very soft polyester ball as well. Again, Columbia dominated throughout the 70s with polyester. Uh, one ball that did, however, get Ebonite really rolling during this era was the Ebonite Magnum 6 that you see right here. This is a ball that Earl Anthony really dominated with during the uh, mid-70s area. Won a ton of balls, or a ton of tournaments, I'm sorry, during that era with this particular ball. They called it the Pumpkin Ball, and it's the Ebonite Magnum 6. Okay, moving on to the next section, we're going to go into the Yellow Dots. Uh, we were talking about the Shore D's earlier becoming outlawed. The yellow dot really became popular because then these met the ABC specifications, but these were still bleeders. They were still really sticky. Again, these are really hard to find because a lot of these weren't that durable and they really cracked. Uh, 75 yellow dots were very, very popular. Uh, Roto Grip here uh, went under contract with Columbia also. So this is a blue Roto Grip, which is basically a, a blue yellow dot is what it is. Um, and then, I'd like Steve to talk about the 9R. We were told the 9R is one of the most popular yellow dots that was ever made for performance. Yeah, yellow dots were dominant at 75, 76, and then during the 1977 and 78, they had a hard time uh, with their formula. The balls weren't, uh, they weren't as soft. They would look more like scarlet white dots. And in 1979, they fixed the formula. The real bleeder came back out after a couple years of the ball not being quite as strong as it was in 75, 76. We actually reached out to Mark Roth and asked him, uh, these balls, serial numbers are very important in regard to yellow dots. And he said his favorite of all time is the 9R yellow dot. That was the one he loved the most, and he was the king of the yellow dot, let's be honest. He was the man. Uh, Ritz touched on it, Roto Grip, basically is the same thing as yellow dot. C5, same thing, just like we talked about with that Pro Classic earlier. C5, Roto Grip, those are the most popular ones if you're, if you're looking for collectibles. Uh, other polyester balls were popular in, the, in that era. Uh, Wayne Webb won a bunch of tournaments with this ball. They called it the Gyro One, the Green Weenie was its nickname. Wayne Webb was with Ebonite at the time, won a bunch of tournaments with that ball as well. Uh, these were a couple other polyester balls that were really popular in that era. And then towards the late 70s, all of a sudden, it went back to rubber again. Uh, rubber kind of took control and they started taking the surface and roughing it up, sanding it. So what you found was they hooked more again. So the LT48, was wow what a dominant ball that was that one uh, it quite frankly during that year hooked more than any ball on the market and another really cool thing about the lt48 which was again a super dominant ball uh, you'll see it was named that even before johnny petragli his name was on it uh, they didn't know what to name the ball when they were uh, in the process i guess of testing you know but they thought they had a winner brunswick really liked uh, what they saw during their testing period um, but they couldn't come up with a name. Uh, LT48 is actually the gentleman that designed the ball for Brunswick. I guess their chemist or their engineer, those were his initials. His name was like Louis Trilo or something like that. So uh, he named it, he just called it LT48 because he was 48 years old at the time that, that ball came out. So when you see the Tommy Hudson LT51, he, same gentleman designed this ball as well. It was three years later, they named it the LT51. So. A little part of bowling trivia for you there, too. Another, uh, not to interrupt you there, another inter interesting fact with the LT48, it was really one of the first porous balls. I can remember having one, and uh, once it picked up the oil, if it sat in a hot car, it, it would be sweating. And uh, another interesting thing, uh, what gave it its porosity was it actually had ground-up walnut shells, believe it or not, in the outer shell. This one right here is extremely rare. It's called the Block Letter LT48. Uh, that's before they signed Johnny Petraglia uh, to put his name on the ball. So if you ever see these laying around, these are extremely hard to find. Um, we've got a couple other LT48s. Other uh, competitors also wanted to come out with balls that were, you know, trying to match up with the LT. This is a an RC5, which is Roto Grip's uh, soft rubber ball. Evan and I came out with a Magnum 10. Again, all these balls were very soft rubber balls, and they hooked a lot. Much different than the balls from the 30s, 40s, and 50s that were again made just for durability. Uh, grip the lane and, and gave you a lot of power. We have some more polyesters over here. These are really unique. Uh, these were actually made by Fab, and it'll be interesting when we get into the urethane era, but Fab was actually produced here in St. Louis uh, by a gentleman named Earl Widman. He bought the weight block from John Fabinich, and they really weren't that interesting back then because it had a big weight block in it, but it was still a polyester type of ball. Uh, but we just thought we'd throw these in with the mix of polyester. Uh, the blue dot became popular 
with Columbia um, back in the lacquer days, the lanes would get really dry. If that yellow dot hooked too much, you could certainly go to your blue dot because it was a very hard, hard finish ball. But the Black Knight was popular because um, some people didn't want the fancy swirly colors. This basically was a black white dot is all it was. Yeah, this specific ball right here is very interesting. Uh, it was considered the big bust. During that era, Columbia was really dominant, right, throughout the 70s with the Sure D and the Yellow Dot. They had one winner after another. They super marketed this particular ball, the Orange Dot, and it came right around late 70s, I think, when it was introduced, it right, right pre to the urethane era, and it really never took off and never and gained they any tried, traction. They tried some porosity with a polyester, but by then it did hook more than the Yellow Dot. But by then, the urethane had come out, and uh, this ball never, never really took off. Over. Never took off. Uh, Red Dot was a good Columbia product. Uh, again, good polyester ball introduced right before ure the polyurethane era. And this particular ball is one of our favorites, too. Uh, during the right around 1980, 1981, this ball was dominant, was it not? I believe back to back years, the Firestone champion, Wayne Webb, and then Steve Cook threw this ball. Uh, it was incredible. It hooked a ton, hit great but it had a, a flaw in the design. The ball actually developed welts, and they it called ripple. it a ripple. It ripple. They yeah. called it a ripple, and as you used it, all of a sudden your ball would start bouncing down the lane. And so uh, they corrected that flaw, and when they corrected it, it wasn't that good anymore after that. So well, the and ones that are then, really valuable, uh, again, for collectible purposes, are the ones that have the, the ripple. The and by then, the urethane had taken over, but that's why we thought we'd uh, include the Mark 10, because that really was the last dominating plastic ball before the urethane took over urethane. right around 1981 correct okay of all the bowling balls in our collection this is actually the one that we have the most sentimental attachment to this is the black beauty that uh, our father ray orf bowled uh the famous or infamous 890 series with back in 1972. uh it's the only rubber ball in the history of the sport of bowling that struck 35 times in a row i doubt it'll ever happen again rich was on the pair with him that day he was i think eight years old or something at the time when dad Correct. Correct. 1972. It was a Western Bowl uh, mini mixed league. Uh, I was seven years old. Uh, fortunately, be on the same pair with them. Like Steve said, definitely very controversial, uh, but we're definitely very proud of it. And uh, we know our father did shoot that score uh, 35 strikes in a row. So this will always uh, be in the ARF family. Absolutely. It's our favorite ball. And uh, thank you all for uh, watching our first session, which covered the rubber and plastic ball era. And now a pleasure to introduce a fellow for whom this is probably his biggest show on TV. He's a youngster out of St. Louis, 22 years old, but don't let the age fool you because he can bomb him out here. He's a St. Louis match game champion. He's averaged 200 in five years of ABC competition. You're going to enjoy watching Ray Orr. Ray, come on up. Hey, good to see you. Thank you, Jack. Nice to be here. Everything fine and you're ready to go. How have you been hitting him in practice? Well, I've been bowling fairly well. I hope to do well on the show. Ray gets that ball out there nicely and bombs the strike. In. He has a good deal of speed, as you've probably been able to discern. He's Ray Orff is also using a crown jewel, as is Al Sal. Oh, boy. He could have three. Looking for the three-bagger. How about that? The kid showing you something? Another 10 pin. That's his second 10 pin he's left over there. This is perhaps his most important ball of the match so far. He might be there. There he is. He'd been failing to carry the 10 pin over there previously. That's correct. Ninth frame for Ray Watt. Maybe that does it. Hey, a beautiful strike to wrap things up for him. Ray in the roll-off. He's had six strikes. That makes it seven. 